McQuestion, talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuestion is made possible in part by individual viewers. The Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation for the Study of Teaching and Self-Government. Hillcrest Foundation, founded by Mrs. W. W. Carruth, Sr. C.F. & Company, LLP, serving Dallas-Fort Worth and the Southwest since 1956. And Sundown Ranch, providers of comprehensive and co-occurring disorder treatment to adolescents and young adults. Scuba divers have long benefited from having hyperbaric oxygen therapy if they should get into trouble. The question is, does this treatment have broader uses for infants with cerebral palsy, people with migraine headaches, and those of us who are older and may suffer a stroke? To answer that question and bring you up to date on the status of this therapy, we have three world-renowned experts. I'd like to start on my right. Dr. Sanchez is Chief of Hyperbaric Medicine in Hospital Angeles in Mexico City, Chief of Hyperbaric Medicine at the National Institute of Cancer, and Professor of Hyperbaric Medicine at the National University of Mexico. Welcome to Texas. Thank you. Thank you. Sitting next to you is Dr. James Toole, a Distinguished Professor of Neurology, Director of the Stroke Research Center at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I may point out. He has spent over 50 years as a neurologist, is the author of Cerebrovascular Disorders, and is world renowned as he's a past president of the World Federation of Neurology and the International Stroke Society. And welcome to the program. Thank you. And finally, uh, Dr. Paul Harch is a clinical assistant professor and director of the LSU School of Medicine's Hyperbaric Medicine Department and Fellowship, and author of a book called The Oxygen Revolution. Welcome to the program as well. Thank you. That person watching this program, Dr. Hart, is likely to say, what in the world are we talking about? Tell us what it is, number one, and how it works. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen is the use of greater than atmospheric pressure oxygen as a drug to treat basic disease processes and hence the diseases. So if we look at diseases and think of them in terms of building blocks, uh, are composed of building blocks such as inflammation and swelling and low oxygen and low blood flow, hyperbaric oxygen treats those disease processes or counteracts them and hence treats the diseases. And the important point is that there are many diseases that have these common building blocks. So potentially there is a huge application for this. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Tua, what are some of those applications that you're seeing out there? Well, I'm an adult uh, neurologist, take care of sick people, most of whom have strokes, so that that's my special interest. And I've been very much impressed with some of the results that the uh, hyperbaric uh, oxygen persons who've been giving these patients treatment have received. So I'm much in favor of doing randomized trials to prove that they work as much as people think they do. Well, and we certainly hope they do, for sure. Yes. Dr. Sanchez, in Mexico, um, you're sort of the person, it seems to me, like in Mexico City. How do things differ there from here, if at all, and how are you seeing this particular therapy used there? Well, there are certain differences, but the scientific part of it is exactly the same, and as strict as in the U.S., you have to go through all the process to do a, a study. The other, the, the good part is that we are have a better understanding of certain things in, in not in the medical part but also in, in the social part so we we are able to do certain things that normally you wouldn't be able to do in the states within the scientific and and, and ethical part of it mm -hmm. uh, dr. Hart you've you've obviously very much an advocate of this yes. because why well, it changed my life in a way, but uh, changed it based on the science of this. Uh, in the late 1980s, we were treating a large number of divers out of the Gulf of Mexico with brain decompression illness. And what we found out was that by the time these guys get from the Gulf to our treatment center in New Orleans, which is 90 miles upstream from the Gulf of Mexico, we were no longer treating what the U.S. Navy has been treating for the better part of 50 years. We were treating more established brain injury. And the simple one treatment, 90% cure, wasn't working. We were having to treat them multiple times. And then we had patients referred weeks and months after their injury, or patients uh, who came back with persistent neurological deficits. And what we tried was a lower dose of this hyperbaric oxygen and found that we could improve them neurologically. From there, we looked at it in Louisiana boxers, then cerebral palsy children, autism, and a wide variety of chronic neurological conditions, and finally duplicated this in an animal model. 
Interesting. Well, we have some very special people here. And uh, Claudine, I'm going to kneel down there next to you with your uh, family. And um, I'm going to ask you, first of all, to tell us who you are, who you have here with you, and then why you're here. Well, my name is Claudine Lenoir. And um, 12 years ago, I gave birth to identical twin boys who you see at either side of me. And they were born at 27 weeks gestation. Um, and this, although the, we can save such tiny preemie babies oh, today, it resulted in cerebral palsy, which is basically lack of oxygen at the time of birth. And both of them suffered brain injury to varying degrees and were later diagnosed with low vision and cerebral palsy, a spastic diplegia for Matthew, meaning it affects his lower limbs, his legs, and Michelle's spastic quadriplegia, which means it affects his whole body. And on a quest, as most parents are that have children that are ill, I uh, did come across hyperbaric oxygen therapy when they were about three years old. And then uh, my quest led me to England initially for this treatment, where we managed to get Matthew actually walking and out of a wheelchair. And Michel, who had no use of his hands or arms at that time, nor did he speak, uh, all of a sudden was able to sit up. He was able to feed himself, drink from a cup for the first time, and he began to speak. And today he speaks uh, both English and French. Um, I'm not sure, Michelle, that having someone who's almost a teenager speaking is a good thing, is it or not? Uh, I'm not sure to say to that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you answered it very well, actually. All right, I'm going to hear some more from these guys and their brother over here, too. But uh, first, I want to run a video. And while we're running this video, I want you to tell us what we're seeing in this video. So if you're ready, you run that video now. <coughs> Well, a couple of years ago, I was uh, fortunate enough to open a center in Montreal, or just outside of Montreal, where I regularly treat the boys, uh, because they will need treatments long term. So here we are in one of our uh, weekly treatments, going into the chamber. And uh, we're about to close the door. Now we're getting them all snuggled up with pillows and making sure that everyone's comfortable inside. These are called oxygen hoods. So the chamber is pressurized with uh, air. And once we get down to the treatment pressure, we, put, uh, we turn on the oxygen, and the oxygen is contained inside the oxygen hood. So the, the chamber that they're in uh, serves what function? If the oxygen is in the hood, so to speak? Well, they have to breathe the oxygen in order for it to enter into the body. And this is one type of chamber. Some chambers are uh, multi-place chambers, which is this one where we can put more than one person in, and the chamber is pressurized with air, as I mentioned, as opposed to oxygen. There is a different type of chamber out there on the market, too, which is a monoplace, which is just for one person, and those chambers are typically pressurized with oxygen. Interesting. That's very interesting. Now then, I want to ask you, because I asked you this before the program, what does it feel like in there? Um, well, once you get in there, it feels good, but when you come out, you feel like you like you stretch, and you feel a lot looser. You think that might work on us old guys who have arthritis or what, huh? Uh, it usually does. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do you get to do when these guys go in there and get to play around in this deal? Um, actually, I go in there too and do exactly what they do, but usually I just keep an eye on them. So you, 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 so you're the babysitter, huh? Does it make you feel any better or not? Uh, it does. It makes you feel a lot better. I, I feel a little looser, like he says, and it's a great feeling. It's really good. That's fabulous. I appreciate your being here, and I really appreciate what this has done for you guys, so congratulations. Now, Dr. Tua, you've, you've heard these kind of stories before, I suppose. I have. Um, why aren't we doing this more than we're doing it right now? I mean, for some reason, there's a controversy attached to this issue of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. What's the controversy? Well, the controversy is would nature fix the problem or does the oxygen uh, provide an impetus or help or make it uh, cure more quickly? Um, I myself am not a pediatrician, so I'd pass on that question, but I could answer it for the old folks uh, that are dementing or getting a little less nimble in, with their brains. And uh, would it, in some way or another, help their memory or prevent them from becoming demented. Which well, is let, me, let me stop you right there. You, you have sold me right here on the memory issue. I mean, I, I have been accused by people, uh, unfortunately, uh, with some truth of having no memory whatsoever. 
are you telling me that this has some hope for us 